are listening to the Caffeinated Thoughts Podcast. Happy Friday. I'm looking forward to the weekend. I hope you are as well. This is Shane Vanderhart, your host. I have several things to talk about today. A couple of conflicting court cases involving religious liberty concerns. A whistleblower uh, who reportedly complained about something President Trump said during a call to Ukraine. Maybe. And a Democrat and Democrat presidential candidates talking crazy. Uh, but that's just another day that ends with why. So before all that, first a word from our sponsor, American Principles Project. At American Principles Project, we believe that human dignity should be at the heart of public policy. We work in all 50 states and in Washington, D.C. to promote life, religious freedom, local control over education, authentic economic progress for working Americans, and a return to constitutional principles such as federalism. Want to help American Principles Project? Visit our website today, AmericanPrinciplesProject.org. That's American Principles, P L E S, Project.org. Sign up for email updates. Help us out. We want to work with you. That's American Principles Project.org. There were a couple of conflicting religious liberty decisions this week. On Monday, the Arizona Supreme Court provided a win for religious liberty. They ruled that the city of Phoenix cannot use criminal law to force two artists to design and create custom wedding invitations, expressing messages that conflict with their core beliefs. Such coercion, the court held, would violate the fundamental principle that, quote, an individual has autonomy over his or her speech and thus may not be forced to speak a message he or she does not wish to say, unquote. The court ruled in favor of uh, Joanna Duca and Brianna Kosky, owners of Brush and Nib Studio, who were under threat of the uh, under threat of up to six months of jail time, a twenty-five hundred dollar um, fine, and three years of probation for each day the city would find them in violation of the law. It's incredible. And the Arizona High Court found that the Phoenix law violated. Uh, Duke and Kosky's free speech protections under their state constitution, as well as their free exercise rights under Arizona's Free Exercise Religion Act. The, rule, the, uh, the justices ruled, uh, wrote in their decision, quote, The rights of free speech and free exercise so precious to this nation since its founding are not limited by soft murmurings, murmurings, excuse me, behind the doors of a person's home or church or private conversations with like-minded friends and family these guarantees provide the right protect the right of every american to express their beliefs in public this includes the right to create and sell words paintings and art that express a person's sincere religious beliefs with these fundamental principles in mind today we hold that the city of phoenix cannot apply its human relations ordinance to force Joanna Duca and Brianna Kosky to create custom wedding invitations celebrating same-sex wedding ceremonies in violation of their sincerely held religious beliefs, unquote. Jonathan Scruggs, a senior counsel with Alliance Defending Freedom, who represented the plaintiffs, said, quote, the government shouldn't threaten artists with jail time and fines to force them to create custom artwork, such as wedding invitations, expressing me- messages that violate their beliefs. And that's what the court had had affirmed uh, today, or on Monday. Joanna and Brianna work with all people. They just don't promote all messages. They, like all creative professionals, should be free to create art consistent with their convictions without the threat of government punishment. Instead, government must protect the freedom of artists to choose which messages to express through their own creations. The court was right to find that protections of free speech and religion protect the freedom of creative professionals to choose for themselves what messages to express through their custom artwork. Unquote. Yes, they should be able to do this. Legally, this should be a no-brainer. Uh, this is not discrimination. It's following their, their religious conscience when receiving a request about a particular event. Uh, to my knowledge, not one Christian business targeted under sexual orientation and gender identity accommodation laws uh, has turned away a customer because they are gay, but because, rather they've denied uh, they've denied requests for particular services related to same-sex wedding, whether it's 
being a you know photographer doing a video or or um in this case obviously the the wedding invitations or making a cake a custom cake um you know it, whether it's for also t there's I, rem I remember there was a t-shirt designer um who refused to to provide a, a t-shirt for a gay pride event you know many of these many of um these businesses have served lgbt customers in other ways they just again don't want to promote that particular message they're not discriminating against lgbtq people i wish we could draw that distinction as a society and see the difference between the two things it's so i i think it's dishonest to call actions like these discrimination when it's not i mean if you want to say they're discriminating against something say they're discriminating against the message not a particular person now on the flip side there's some bad news on thursday the California Court of Appeals ruled that a transgender person can sue a Catholic hospital for refusing to perform a hysterectomy. Uh, the plaintiff, Evan um, Minton, uh, a transgender man, for translation purposes, a you know biological female, initially scheduled a hysterectomy for August 30th, 2016 at Mercy San Juan Medical Center, uh, which is part of the Dignity Health Hospital Network as a treatment for gender dysphoria. Now, you got to understand, Mercy is a Catholic hospital, and the day before the sur scheduled surgery, Mercy canceled the procedure, citing uh, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops' Ethical and Religious Directives for Catholic Health Care Services. The directives prohibited direct sterilization, and they don't, they didn't prohibit it specifically just for uh, you know, a sex reassignment surgery, but any kind of steriliz direct sterilization goes against Catholic belief. So, you know, shocking, a Catholic hospital upheld a Catholic religious directive. Now, Mercy then recommended that Minton's doctor obtain emergency admitting privileges at a nearby hospital, another nearby hospital, a Methodist hospital, I believe, that was also part of the same health network, so there wouldn't have been like insurance problems or anything like that. Uh, Minton's doctor actually did that perform that did that surgery three days later, and then Minton sued, claiming gender identity discrimination. So David French, writing about the ruling at National Review, wrote, "Quote." Note the burden this ruling places on Catholic institutions. They will be compelled to provide care unless they actively facilitate the provision of care elsewhere, and even the most brief delays are legally intolerable, unquote. He also said that while the case was decided under California state law by a California appeals court, and you're probably hearing my mini schnauzer in the background. <laughs> Missy, stop. Sorry, this is... This is the problem with, with recording a podcast at home. Anyway, as I was saying, French said that while the case was described, decided under California state law by a California appeals court, applying a California, California statutory and constitutional analysis, the U.S. Constitution applies as well. And there's a case before the Supreme Court, uh, he said, that could impact the ruling as well. Uh, Sharon L. Fulton v. City of Philadelphia. He writes... Quote, while Fulton and the California case are obviously not identical, a ruling protecting religious liberty in Fulton would create a, pre a federal precedent that the F California state court would be required to consider. Moreover, the petitioners in Fulton are asking the Supreme Court to correct a historical wrong. They're asking the court to reverse Antonin Scalia's great mistake, his opinion in Employment Division v. Smith, that gutted the free exercise claw of the First Amendment and greatly expanded state authority over religious individuals and religious institutions. At present, blue states across the United States are attempting to use expansive non-discrimination to coerce religious institutions to violate their religious principles as a condition for providing charitable or, or commercial services in their state. Even in the absence of any evidence that any LGBT person has been denied, denied access to adoption services or medical care, states are bringing down the hammer. For example, in Fulton, the city took action against CSS, Catholic uh, Social Services, 
even though not one LGBT couple had approached CSS for foster services from its opening in 1917 through the filing of the case in 2018. In the California case, the court ruled that there could be actionable discrimination even though LGBT, LGBT plaintiff obtained the services he sought from the defend, defendant in the case, unquote. So that's a case we'll have to watch closely. Now on to a potential White House whistleblower scandal first reported by the Washington Post. The New York Times in a follow-up article provides details. I'm uh, using the word details very loosely here. They report, quote, a potentially explosive complaint by a whistleblower in the Intelligence Committee said to involve President Trump emerged on Thursday as the latest front in a continuing oversight to dispute, be, dispute between administration officials and House Democrats. While the allegation remains shrouded in mystery, it involves at least one instance of Mr. Trump making an unspecified commitment to a foreign leader and includes other actions, according to interviews. At least part of the allegation deals with Ukraine, two people familiar with it said. The complaint submitted by a member of the Intelligence Committee to the Inspector General reviewed the questions about how the President handles delicate matters, unquote. You know, they continue uh, later on in the article, they write, quote, Though it is not clear how Ukraine fits in the allegation, so questions have already emerged about Mr. Trump's dealings with its government. In late July, he told the country's new president, uh, Volodymyr uh, Zelensky, I probably butchered that name, but anyway, going, going on, that Ukraine could improve its reputation and its interaction with the United States by investigating corruption, according to a Ukrainian government summary of that call. Some of Mr. Trump's close allies were also urging the Ukrainian government to investigate matters that could hurt the president's p political rivals, including former Vice President Joseph R. Biden Jr., and his family, unquote. Uh, the ally in question is primarily G Rudy Giuliani, Trump's personal lawyer, who reportedly pushed the Ukrainians to release information about former Vice President Joe Biden's business ties to Ukraine. Going on, quote, they write, quote, uh, the, con the controversy first erupted a week ago when Re Representative Adam B. Schiff, Democrat of California, and the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee revealed the existence of of the complaint disclosed that the acting director of national intelligence, Joseph uh, McGuire, had blocked the inspector general from sharing it with Congress as generally required by law. The inspector general deemed the complaint legitimate and opened an inquiry, unquote. The Daily Caller reported, quote, House Democrats have investigated whether Trump and Giuliani improperly used leverage against Ukraine in order to obtain information about Joe Biden's financial ties to Eastern Euro the Eastern European nation. Some news outlets have reported the Trump administration threatened to withhold $250 million in military aid from Ukraine, which they actually ended up receiving. Uh, picking back up the New York Times article, uh, they write, quote, Democrats accused Mr. McGuire of ignoring the law possibly to protect Mr. Trump or another high-level official, though intelligence officials insisted they blocked lawmakers' access to the complaint in accordance with the law, not politics. The Daily Caller wrote that, that um, McGuire has withheld the complaint at the advice of the Justice Department claiming privileged communication. Now, I think it's important to take whistleblower complaints seriously, and those people must be protected because they are vital in holding government officials accountable. That said, this particular story is really nothing so far but third-hand sources and innuendo. If um, Trump withheld, uh, th threatened to withhold funding if Ukraine would not investigate Biden, then yeah, that that's uh, obviously that's a problem. That's an abuse of power. Uh, but there is no evidence that happened. Uh, Ukraine did receive the funding. No information has been released, and and. As far as we know, there is no investigation into that uh, beyond the House Democrat investigation. Um, I do find it hypocritical that those who were concerned about President Trump's business dealings in Russia appear to be disinterested in Biden's potential ties in Ukraine. If it's good for the goose, it should be good for the gander, don't you think? Also, in the name of breaking news first, media outlets publish stories with scant information. Here's what we really know. Uh, about this whole situation. Somebody complained about something and it made deal with Ukraine. That's it. 
the law notwithstanding, releasing uh, information about a complaint before it's investigated seems premature. Shifting gears here to the uh, Democratic presidential field, I've written that the Democrat race is essentially a three-person uh, one uh, between former Vice President Joe Biden, U.S. Senator Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts, and U.S. Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont. If both Warren and Sanders stay in, I'm doubtful either can eclipse Biden's support. Um, that said, he is gaff prone. As we saw uh, this week during a speech at the AFL-CIO 2020 Workers Presidential Candidate Summit Candidate Forum in uh, Philadelphia on Tuesday. I want to play that clip for you. And... You get a tax break for a racehorse. Why in God's name couldn't we provide an $8,000 tax credit for everybody who has child care costs? It would put, it would put 720 million, back, million women back in the workforce. It would increase. 720 million women back into the workforce. Well, there's an obvious problem with that because our population is only 330 million. Biden has gaffes, but his primary opponents just say crazy crap. Uh, U.S. Senator Michael Bennett of Colorado, who is generally considered more moderate uh, out of those remaining in the field, uh, during uh, MSNBC's climate forum at Georgetown University on Thursday, complained that democracy is getting in the way of, of dealing with climate change. Here's that clip. The, the other test, and I think this is a test that's not well understood by some of the candidates in the race and not what has not been well debated is is our democracy up to this task and that is a really non-trivial question because i mean it clearly isn't right now so far we have not we haven't been and 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 when you lose a national race as we did in 16 to a climate denier that creates a real concern because you can't act urgently on climate if you have a climate denier in the white house but wait a second or if the, 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 I, I want to make sure I understand this, because to me, you, what, the point that you're making is, is a crucial one, right? The democratic structural impediments to big change on the level necessary to deal with the climate crisis are prior to the specific solutions exactly. to what we will exactly. do, okay? Exactly. So the, That's exact, much better said. That's <laughs> the point that I'm trying so, to so yeah, it's it's you know, it's much easier to to for tyrants to implement big change, because you know democracy gets in the way. Um, then you have tech entrepreneur Andrew Yang at the same forum forum who said that one of the goals is that people of climate of addressing climate change is that people will not own their own cars. Find that clip here. Maybe. So you have this ability to uh, envision the future, right? With your, your proposals on universal basic income, you've, you've played the whole chess game out and you see what it looks like uh, on the other end. Play the chess game out on climate change, the positive incentives, the regulation that Cliff was just talking about, the uh, reduction of, the, uh, of our, uh, you know, weaning off fossil fuels and eliminating them possibly. Uh, all of, what does that look like to you? What does the world look like to you in 2050? What physically do you think we will do do differently than we do today uh, that will result in us fighting climate change? Well, I mentioned before that we might not own our own cars. Our current car ownership and usage model is really inefficient and bad for the environment. Um, so you might have a society, you guys all probably agree with this because you're quite young. You're, you know, when I, when I was your age, I was like a car, and like having that car was such a big deal. You know, I was driving like a 1985 Honda Accord that could like barely get up hills. And I was like, yeah, and I was like rolling the window down like this. And, uh, so it, it, what, what we're really selling is not the car, it's mobility. And so if you have mobility that's then tied into uh, a much more, if you had like, for example, this constant roving fleet of electric cars that you would just order up, then you could diminish the impact of ground transportation on, on our environment very, very quickly. Uh, so that, that's a very, very clear one. So then uh, <laughs> he also suggests a syntax of sorts where the cost of emissions will be tacked on the cost of beef in order to make it more expensive so people eat less of it. 
And here's that clip. Hi, I'm Addison Dyer. I'm a sophomore at Georgetown studying healthcare management. And my question was, realistically, the only way to curb expansion and reduce the environmental impact of the cattle industry is to reduce demand. Um, what policy adjustments would you make to reduce this demand? I'm glad you asked that because we wanted to talk about food and the, the rate at which agriculture, not everybody thinks about this, is a major contributor to, uh, to CO2. Now, cattle is very energy consuming and energy expensive. Uh, and if you project forward on what we would need to do to reduce emissions, you would want to modify Americans' diets over time. Now, some of that is happening naturally through education. I do think it's difficult to regulate diets. Um, so what you would want to do, again, is you'd want those uh, cattle producers to have to internalize the cost of emissions. Because if your cattle ends up um, polluting a lot, which they do just naturally, we don't hate them for it. I mean, they're just big animals. <laughs> don't hate the cattle, hate them, whatever. Uh, so then what that would naturally do, and some people are going to hate this, but it would probably make those products more expensive. Um, and that is appropriate because there's a cost to producing food in that way. Uh, and so if you were to make it more expensive, then you would end up changing consumption patterns over time. So, yeah, he also said the, 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 the line that really got me um, is that regulating diets is hard to do. Um, regulating diets would be unconstitutional. Uh, the federal government should be regulating our diets. The federal government shouldn't be putting on an artificial cost of emissions onto cattle production. I mean, from an agricultural state here in Iowa, this, uh, you know, that would kill farmers. Uh, that would be, that, uh, you know, reducing beef, even though we're not necessarily a huge beef production state, um, but who's to say that, that this policy is not going to implement other types of meat either? So, you know, I have to admit, personally, I like Andrew Yang because he seems to be someone who does not hate a guy like me. Um, he's, I appreciate he's also willing to answer questions posed to him that he, you know, doesn't ob obfuscate and, and, and uh, uh, talk in generalities, but he tries to directly answer questions that, that people, you know, ask him. Um, yeah, he's, he's a funny guy as well, but that doesn't make some of his ideas any less harmful or crazy like his freedom dividend, which provides thousand dollars a month to every American. You know, it's great that he wants to bless people with his own money that way. He currently, um, is giving a thousand dollars a month to, I think, 10 different, uh, people that sign up, you know, that's his money. If he wants to do that, good for him. Um, certainly a thousand dollars a month would be would be a, a blessing for a lot of people but taxpayers can't afford it and you know the government being involved in this would be literally government sponsored wealth redistribution which is socialism uh, so you know that's an awful idea and when we're already looking at you know gosh 20 I think 23 trillion dollars uh, in debt you know we just can't afford it doing anything like that nor should we even if we could afford it um then you had marianne williamson uh talk about nuclear energy and for the life of me i have no idea what she's even saying in this clip i'm gonna play that for you here go ahead good afternoon miss williamson uh thank you for taking my question my name is emily berry and i'm a student from the university of maryland college park i'm studying government and politics and economics um, so you say that in your environmental crisis plan that you want the United States to stop all use of nuclear energy. What do you identify as the problems with nuclear energy, and what do you say to those who think it simply gets a bad reputation? What was the last thing you said? What do I say what, to what those do you, who what? What are, your, what are your issues with nuclear energy? <clears throat> well, I know Germany had said at one point, we're just going no nuclear. But then when they said no nuclear, there was a problem because they had a hard time keeping up with the other standards that they agreed to. What is wrong with that? If something goes wrong with nuclear energy, I don't think people have really stopped to take in the horror. See, we need an integrated politics. 
We need to go beyond hard data. We need to go beyond just thinking about the facts. I want you to think about this with your heart. Something goes wrong there. What are we even talking about? How can we even consider it? And so, so what? Maybe we'd all be a little warm or a little cool. I mean, I'm. What are we even talking about? I mean, what is she even saying? Forget about facts, hard facts. Forget about the, or excuse me, the hard data. Uh, go beyond the facts. Think with our heart. Well, I think with my heart that Williamson would be a disaster as president. Uh, Congressman Tim Ryan of Ohio says that the federal government should be involved in family planning. Isn't that a delight to think? Hello, Congressman Ryan. Hi. My name is uh, Clayton Canal. I'm in the McDonough School of Business here, freshman, probably studying finance. Uh, my question oh, is... I'm not sure just yet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not yet. Mm. My question is, what effect do you feel that overpopulation has with global warming, and should we be doing, doing anything to combat this? Uh, it's, about, it's about resources. So, yeah, I mean, I think we should be active, again, with international agencies, uh, within the State Department. Now, the President wants, wants to cut the State Department budget dramatically. We need to be involved in the United Nations family planning efforts around the world. I think we need to continue to do that. It's, a, it's an important uh, approach that we need to continue to make. Well, that's uh, fascinating. Uh, yeah, no, I don't want the federal government shouldn't be involved in, in uh, family planning, whether it's uh, abroad or here at home. And then uh, rounding out last clip, South Bend Mayor Pete Buttigieg compares Democrats' climate agenda to the American Revolution. Seriously, he does this. Here's a clip. Maybe. Played out. I actually think this is one of those moments that, um, like many moments in American history, really pivotal ones, like uh, maybe the American Revolution itself, the, uh, the, the struggle for civil rights. Uh, it may be that of all of the things we're doing right now, the thing we're going to be remembered for mm -hmm. will boil down to where we were on this issue. Good. Well, when it comes to Democrats saying insane things to appeal to their far left base, we could go on and on, but I have to wrap it up for now. Thank you so much for listening to the Caffeinated Thoughts podcast. If you happen to be listening to this podcast somewhere other than on our website, please make sure to go, you go to check out caffeinatedthoughts.com. That's C-A-F-F-E-I-N-A-T-E-D thoughts.com or just Google Caffeinated Thoughts and we'll show up at the top of your search screen. Also, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, sign up for our emails so you don't miss a single article. You can also subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, or actually, excuse me, Apple Podcasts, it's now called. Be sure to give us five stars, please. We'd appreciate it. You can also listen on Google Play, Podbean, Stitcher, Spotify, and SoundCloud. If you're not a subscriber, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. And you can listen using your favorite podcast app. Until next time, my friends, this is Shane Vanderhart. Take care.